then post them on our YouTube because we are so fancy in 21st century. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen while I go over our agenda really quickly and then actually get things going. So uh, as always, I'm starting with just our website because we are trying to put a lot of information and keep our website updated. And every month we'll have our Zoom login information right at the top and then some bullet points that link you to our current agenda, our minutes, any documents that are relevant to today's meeting. And so today we have some draft comments that are pretty beefy. So if you wanna look at those while we're chatting, you can do that. Uh, and then we have a meeting handouts tab where we have lots of updates from our assembly, from our state legislators, from the airport, any, any handouts that we would typically have in a meeting, we have them on this other meeting handouts page. Um, and then we'll talk about these things, but as you keep scrolling, you'll see we're gonna have a candidate forum to talk about. We have a sign, we have a sheet that you can fill out to ask questions, COVID resources, and then here you go, you can see some of the past uh, meetings that we've had. So with that, what we've got today for our agenda is, um, uh, two, two main things. We're going to have our regular updates with our state legislators and uh, local anchorage reports. And then we've got two kind of special topics around the AMATS non-motorized plan and Chugach Way Area Transportation Elements Report. So two kind of transportation related projects, community announcements where a lot of folks, like if you're running for office or you have community announcements, we give you a couple of minutes to share out to the group. And we've revised our door prizes, which are very exciting. And so we will also be giving out door prizes, but you have to be present to win. <laughs> so stick around, it's gonna be worth it. Um, so that's, that's what we've got on our agenda today. And then we do have our minutes posted from our February meeting. And those two items are part of our consent agenda. So I'd, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve our consent agenda. Would anyone like to move? I know Bob wants to, but he's muted. Move to approve. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks, Irene. Um, anything else for today's agenda from the group? Okay, before I go into that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna introduce our executive board members. Um, put in a lot of uh, time and energy into this, so I appreciate it. Let's see. So we've got Meg, who is our secretary, and she is taking the notes for today's meeting. We have Irene, who's our vice president, holds down the fort, lit local historian, joke maker extraordinaire. Um, let's see. Uh, Julie is here. Hey, Julie. Ju Julie is an auditor for our executive board. And Irina also is here. She serves as our treasurer. And then we have two auditors who, who aren't here, uh, Tani, uh, who will join late, and Peggy, who's not feeling well. So thank you, exec board, for all that you do. And with that, we have state legislative reports, and we're excited to have Representative Matt Clayman, who actually had the idea of having like a rotating crew of, of state legislative updates. And I saw Harriet, I saw your message that you just love being here, but if you wanna add anything after Matt, that'd be great too. But I'll just turn it over to you, okay. Representative Clayman. Thank you. Lindsay, thank you, for, thank you for having me as well as Representative Drummond. Uh, it's been a real adventure so far in Juneau in terms of it's taken us almost 30 days to get the house organized. Uh, we still have a coalition majority. It's actually pretty impressive that we're the only state in the country that has one of the houses of the legislature in all the partisanship that goes on in the country. We're the only bod legislative body in the country that has tripartisan leadership of Democrats, Republicans, and independents. And, and you just have to come to one of our meetings uh, to realize that we really make a lot of compromises to be able to move forward with Alaska's agenda. I would say the two biggest issues that we're dealing with, one is the budget. Uh, the budget's obviously been going on for a while, but the big big issue is there's a, over a billion dollar deficit in the budget. And I increasingly believe the big issue that we're gonna have to address this year and the years going forward is the question of dividends or taxes that 
if if we're not prepared to raise taxes, we really can't afford to keep paying dividends. And the massive budget cuts that the governor proposed when he first came into office really brought a whole recall effort before him. And so you really see no meaningful efforts from the governor to make substantial cuts that he had proposed. And that's because they're incredibly unpopular people. Like we like our schools, we like our road plowing, we like we like our parks, we like a lot of the things that the state provides. And we really have cut the budget to the bone. And so we're we really come to a day where we're going to have to choose between taxes and dividends. And and I think that's that's the big issue in front of us in terms of the budget. And that that literally the dividend, I think, is the elephant in the room. And then I think the second big issue that we're really working and trying to pick up speed on is the COVID disaster declaration. We really need to focus, I believe, on on testing, treatment, and vaccination for people. And we need to extend that disaster declaration. There's financial issues as well, but the short term is we need to take that measure so we can keep doing a lot of that extra treatment, treatment and vaccination and testing that we've been able to do with the earlier emergency declaration. So we're working on that in the House. The Senate's working on it. I, I myself wish we were going faster. I'm somewhat disappointed that the delay in organization meant we couldn't pass that earlier, but it, but I know the Health and Human Services Committee is taking that up, uh, continuing to hear that tomorrow and forging ahead. So I'm optimistic that we'll get something passed here in the next several days and that the governor will sign it. I won't go into more details about other things. I'm more than happy to take questions you may have, and I always welcome comments that you can offer us to consider as we move forward. And I would just close by saying, it's just great. I think Spinard has done a great job of really focusing more on your community issues and less hearing from people like me. And so I look at the number of people on the Zoom and it's really remarkable and it shows that the, imp the impact of having meaningful community participation. So thank you for that example. Great, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll look and see if there are any questions folks have in the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll just turn it over to Representative Drummond to also share out any update if you'd like. Uh, thank you. It's nice to see all of you. Um, I don't have that much to add to what Matt had to say other than we started uh, in earnest on our budget subcommittees this week. Um, you can just tell every committee room is full of people all the time. And uh, each standing committee, like education, has responsibility for the budget of its department to, um, to look into that budget carefully over several weeks um, and uh, make recommendations to the, um, the full finance committee. Um, and each budget subcommittee has, as its, as its temporary chair, one of the members of the finance committee for that one, and, it, and in addition, some of these budget subcommittees also have an addition of a minority finance committee member. Um, so, and and we have a whole bunch of freshmen in the house this year. So there's a lot of a lot of learning going on. Um, but it's uh, it's good to be uh, it's good to be moving uh, moving again. Last year we finished once we got organized. Last year we were organized, but we finished the budget um, in the budget subcommittees in three weeks. Our budget subcommittee chairs are saying um, that they're looking to be finished by the end of March. Um, and apparently there is a statute that says we have to be finished with the budget subcommittee work by March 28th. I have a feeling we're gonna be done sooner. So keep an eye, keep an eye on that. Um, other than that, uh, there's not that much uh, going on. The other thing to remember is that even though if we pass the, um, the CARES Act, um, or the, excuse me, the emergency declaration, um, reauthorization, the Senate has to do the same. The Senate has not moved its, um, its version of that bill out of Senate finance yet to the Senate floor. So um, whatever, whatever we generate in the House has to pass through the Senate and get approved. I think they're waiting for ours, but it's hard to tell until we get, uh, we get some, uh, some action going, so hopefully we'll get going. And meanwhile, you know that we had a um, couple of positive COVID tests in the, in the legislature. It's in the uh, Capitol, it's a tight building. Uh, we're very close to each other. And uh, there are, I believe there are 13 people currently quarantining. Um, 
including about, there's at least six legislators in the House that are quarantining and unable to, um, unable to show up on the House floor to vote. And right now, if we were have to have to vote on anything, we don't have a, a change in our uniform rules that says that um, somebody else can push the yes or the no button uh, for us on the House floor. Right now, even if you're in the hospital in Juneau or in quarantine in Juneau, you have to be physically in that room to press those buttons. Um, committees are a different story. Uh, there are plenty of people participating remotely um, uh, on, on committee work, um, even from their offices, just to keep down the, uh, the size of the, um, of the crowd in a particular committee room. And some of those committee rooms are really tight. So anyway, it's been fascinating. And uh, thank you for letting me uh, address you guys tonight. Great, thanks for joining. And there is one question in the chat um, from Brian. What about cutting spending instead of going straight to tax increases? So you both mentioned the budget. I'm not sure who would wanna take that. I'm happy to answer the question on, on spending. We've cut from the budget, I think in, we started cutting really in 2015. Every year that since I've been in the legislature, we've made substantial cuts. I think the total cuts in, I, I think it's a couple of billion dollars in cuts. And so the downward pressure on the budget is going to continue. And that's that's gonna be the case no matter what, but the, the ability to actually solve the $1.2 billion deficit through cuts is at this point, I think pretty much everybody in the capital would agree that's unrealistic. And in terms of dividends versus taxes, we don't need to raise taxes if we stop paying dividends. If we don't pay dividends, if you, if you wanna to go to the Commonwealth North website and go through the exercise, it's, I think it's Alaska budget exercise. It's a 28 question process. And, you get to go through the process yourself and try to figure out cuts and how do you how do you balance the budget but the 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 most the basic level is that you you save around 600 million dollars by not paying dividends of a thousand dollars and if oil goes up a, goes up a bit your deficit ends up being closer to closer to 100 million or less and so you can actually likely balance the budget with some cuts uh, a little bit more revenue than originally projected for oil and not paying a dividend. The political problem is not paying a dividend is incredibly unpopular, but the notion that we actually have to pay taxes to solve the budget problem is, I don't think that's true. You can solve the budget problem by stopping paying dividends. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. Any, any question? Okay, here's, one from Sarah. Um, are there any discussion about keeping dividends and implementing taxes? Uh, there are discussions of there are discussions of keeping dividends and paying taxes. Uh, the reality is now we've been talking. Governor Walker proposed nine different tax measures, and literally the only the only two tax increases we passed were a one cent increase. In the in funds relating to oil spills, and this this is an oil spills in the ocean, but kind of on ground oil spills. So it's a cleanup fund in DEC for for spill response, and the other increase was an increase on hunting licenses, and the hunting license fees because that predated statehood. The hunting license fees stay within Department of Fish and Game, but those are the only two revenue measures that have passed the entire time I've been in the legislature, and so. There's certainly discussion of them. The House created a Ways and Means Committee this, se this, this session to look at potential revenues, but unless you can get the unless you can get the full legislature, both House and Senate, on board, then we may not get very far with taxes. And then you can add to that that the governor has said he won't support any taxes that are not put in front of the public for a for a public vote, either yay or nay. And if the public doesn't support it, then he doesn't want anything to do with it. Uh, another uh, place to put in context, the governor's 10-year financial plan includes 900 million to 1.3 billion in new revenue for fiscal year 2023. And that actually means in the calendar year 2022, the election year, there would need to be new revenue for his 10-year plan to work out. And when asked about where is the governor's proposal to raise this basically billion dollars in new revenue? The governor's answer is that he doesn't have a plan. That's for the legislature to figure out. 
Thank you. There's a, there are a lot more comments in the chat about the budget. And I don't want to take away from the rest of our meeting. So if you both could just take a look at that, we appreciate you being here. Um, and I'm just going to keep us rolling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we're going to turn to more local issues for our, our Anchorage updates. And we'll start with our assembly report with uh, assembly member Cameron Presverdia. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, lots to share, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, I, I know we've got a, you've got a full agenda tonight. I would just say that um, that uh, in terms of COVID, the as as most most that are following it, the cases seem to be flattening. Um, we're in um, you know a similar place uh, that we were you know between July and and November, and it's it's still from from the CDC's per, per perspective in terms of their scale, we're still just between sort of extremely high and, and just, just below that in terms of high. Hospital capacity seems to be getting better and better, which is really good news. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of um, work at, at trying to sort of uh, make sure that there's frequent testing for high risk populations. Um, I sent out, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I've been sending out the weekly up update. So I won't go through all of it, but I'll just sort of hit on a few items that I think, think are important in there. Um, uh, the, uh, the rent and mortgage relief utility assistance, the applications for rent relief are, are, are still open until, um, until the end of the day on March 5th. So uh, make sure that that information continues to get out. As of the morning of February 25th, um, uh, nearly 11,500 Anchorage residents applied for rent relief. Um, tourism relief, the application period for these grants closed last week. Visit Anchorage and the contractor managing the grant program um, is close to wrapping up the work and on vetting over 200 applications received and will initiate funds distribution. Um, and it's going to happen this, this week. Uh, in terms of restaurant rescue pro program, the United Way and Anchorage of Anchorage and Alaska Hospitality Retailers Association meals program will end on March 7th. We're currently brainstorming ways to fundraise for this program and continue given the importance of our restaurant industry and recipients. Um, one more that, 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 that's, that's of particular interest to me, um, the, the COVID-19 Peer Leader Navigator Program. Since the end of September 2020, this program has reported more than 1,208 hours of direct peer support and have helped um, 1,237 individuals, um, helping them have access to services and information in 66 unique and countable ways. The main topics um, have been around food supplies, health and information, rent and mortgage assistance, childcare, employment, pub public assistance, um, um, and a language other than English is used for almost 90% of these con contacts, including um, Arabic and Korean and Russian and Samoan and Spanish and Tongan and, and a variety of others. So I'm really, really proud of that, of that work. Um, um, so most of the work that we have been fo focusing on, if you've been following the, the assembly meetings, um, cer so certainly there has been a, a fair amount of dis discussion about, about uh, COVID and about the response, um, I, I, I can say that I think we, we, we expect a new emergency order to come out tomorrow um, that will likely ease up some of the restrictions. And the, the intention is to, to continue to sort of thoughtfully ease up based on the data that, that, that we have. Um, so um, uh, more information to, to come, I think, from, from the mayor's office tomorrow. Um, and finally, I would just uh, say that we had a really productive public safety uh, meeting tonight. Um, I wanted to make sure people knew that both the Anchorage police chief and the Anchorage fire chief are both retiring. And so um, there is there's a fair amount of discussion about um, ensuring that there is public process in terms of that hiring of new folks in those, 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 those roles. Um, also, the, 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 I'm really excited about the mobile crisis response team, which is really going to, I think, more effectively address uh, the, the, the homeless and mental health issues that we're seeing in our city. And so that team is ramping up. They now have uh, folks hired. They have 
space that, that is being, being being created, and I'm excited to, to to see that that team ramp up and and begin to work um, uh, with, with with all of our teams uh, to to address the homelessness and mental health issues in our city. Um, uh, the, the only other thing I would say is that um, uh, just a, a heads up on the, the, the state has announced a change in, in the marijuana ed edibles cap, moving it from, from five to, to 10 mil 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 milligrams. And so there, there's a fair amount of discussion on that. And uh, both the, the Angry Ang Ang Police Department and the, the Department of Health have, have come out saying that they're, they're concerned about that. Um, and so there's, there's a fair amount of discussion within the assembly around that. Um, and then finally, um, coming very soon are the first quarter budget revisions. And so there's a, a, a lot of discussion within all the different areas of the city around, um, around those ideas around where we're gonna invest if, if there are additional funds uh, within the first quarter. So there's a discussion in all of the different areas around that. So in, in the interest of time, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions, thanks. Sure, thank you. There are lots of questions and comments in the chat and a few around the rental assistance program. So just wanted to see if you, we could circle back on that and if you could share out um, what you know about the eligibility and the amount that's available. I can also post the link for the Alaska Housing Finance Authority or Corporation. They have, um, they've been administering the rental program as I understand it, but anything you can add on that. No, just I, I talked about it the, la the last time. I would encourage f folks to go to the web website. Um, un un unfortunately, this pot, pot of money does not, you know, people who own homes do not qualify. It's, it's for um, uh, folks who are rent renting and there is a, there is a uh, cr criteria rel related to in income and a variety of things. And so um, the, the, the eligibility requirements are all list listed on there. So for more information, I would go on to their site and, and read that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think Paul has a question on this. So we'll, we'll go over to Paul. Uh, hello, Cameron, we've spoken in the past. Yeah. Uh, good to see you tonight. Uh, what I'm what I'm bumping up against on the rental assistance program, it sounds good. The advertising has been good. What the tenants are coming back with is they have to be current on rent in order to qualify. Hmm. And most, I could be wrong. That's, that's my question. That, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound correct to, to me, but I, but I certainly if I follow up on it. Um, I, I've had a number of, of conversations with folks who applied for it. And my impression was that they were not current. So um, let me follow up, follow up on that and I can get back to you directly. And I can also send the response to Lindsay so she, she can distribute it. No, I really appreciate it because we got folks that are back almost, I got one at 6,500 right now. Yeah, yeah, that's all I was saying. I, I had a conversation with two, two people just uh, a couple days ago who both were applying for it and both were way, way behind. So but what, what's happened is everyone, they've all stopped paying rent this month in the anticipation of getting 12 months free rent. I see. And that's a dangerous position to put people in that don't qualify and aren't sophisticated enough to read what you've put forward, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. People can call in too. I know that they, it's hard they, to navigate. They the try, websites. they try, Lindsay, and they just, they don't have it in them. Tr mm -hmm. Trust me. Yeah. I'll let it go. Thank you, Cameron. I, I yeah. hear you. Um, there are a lot more comments, but like always, we can't get to them all. And I, I'm looking to see if we have Star Marset here for our school board update. I'm not seeing her name. Anyone? Okay, I'll turn it over um, to John Johansson for the airport report because I do think we'll have a bit to talk about with the police report right after this. So, um, John, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I don't have very much. Our airport update is on our website at anchorageairport.com. I'll just be real quick with the things that are listed on there. Kind of our coronavirus update, we're still doing all we can to uh, make the airport a a safe place to to visit and, and travel from and through. We've done a lot to uh, sanitize the facility and uh, we're also the DHSS is still um, still there, um, manned up, uh, providing uh, screening and uh, and uh, um, virus testing for uh, visitors and um, and residents both. Uh, the seaplane base, Lake Hood, is uh, frozen over, as we know, and uh, it's being used as an uh, airfield, so please stay off it, as usual. I make that note 
every month, but uh, we continue to have people that are recreating on the ice and causing us problems with the FAA in, in keeping uh, incursions down on the on the airfield. Cell phone parking lot, we're still encouraging people to use that. We still have a lot of congestion at the terminal uh, during peak times on the arrivals ramp. So um, please wait there in the cell phone lot, which is the first right. Uh, when you're coming in on the international after you pass uh, Spinard Jewel Lake intersection and uh, wait there for your friends and family uh, until they call you on their cell phone and then pick them up on their, um, at the curbside. Still looking for a lot of, uh, to fill a lot of positions at the airport, including police and fire officers uh, and a bunch of maintenance positions, which are listed on the uh, update with uh, a link to uh, Workplace Alaska, where you can find information on those positions. That's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to entertain them. Great, thanks, John. We do have a question from Kelly about um, the cell phone lot and um, who is paying to provide the porta potty and trash cans there. That's a good question. Um, if there are porta potties there at the cell phone lot, it is the airport who is paying for them. I, I was unaware we actually had them there. That must be something new. Mm -hmm. Great, any questions for John? Okay. Thank you much. Well, thank you. It's been a few months since we've had um, the Anchorage Police Department representative. So thank you for being here. It looks like we have Officer Mays. Maybe there's also an officer read, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna turn it over to you to share out. Um, and we usually have lots of good questions on this front as well. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. So Officer Reed wasn't able to make it, unfortunately. Um, so I know beforehand you had mentioned a couple concerns uh, specifically regarding speeding on Spinard Road and then activity set at Chelsea. Um, so as far as uh, just to address those, um, I know it's it's been a push to update equipment and get it issued um, to folks so that speed enforcement can be um, kind of ramped up. And then especially with schools coming back in, uh, making sure that we're focusing on those areas as well. Um, so that's something that um, is gonna be across shifts. Um, so hopefully we'll see that continue to, to ramp up um, and be enforced. And then as far as the Chelsea, um, I did pull uh, just some information regarding the calls we've been to there and the dispositions of those calls. So um, kind of generally what's been going on as far as police presence. Um, so it looks like we've had about 10 to 15 calls for service at the Chelsea. Um, and then uh, those have ranged from medic assists uh, to disturbances, uh, suicidal calls, um, things like that. And then um, specifically, I'm sure, regarding uh, some of the drug activity and prostitution activity there. Um, I know that's something that on swing shift, uh, which operates from 3 p.m. to 1 a.m. Uh, we're fairly active um, at a lot of the hotels and uh, motels along Spinard Road, specifically at the Chelsea, um, trying to make sure that we're stopping cars, um, talking to folks, uh, and just have a general presence in the area. Um, so hopefully that addresses some of that. And then obviously I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we we talked about those two issues a few months back and then they weren't quickly in the news for uh, bad reasons. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we've got some time to go through some of these questions. Um, so a question from Brian is um, about speeding or how to get speed humps installed on Turnigan Street. It's a shortcut from Spinard to Northern Lights. Uh, and that's that's definitely something um, a lot of our kind of call them collector roads. They have a lot of uh, speeding uh, that happens. And we actually just uh, passed a resolution about traffic calming, which is a funny way to phrase it, but that's uh, for speed humps and other other things that we can do to try to slow traffic down. 
And I don't think Turnigan Street was on our list. So that actually is, is something that we can follow up on, um, Brian, because we, we do want to make sure that we're prioritizing roadways um, where that kind of behavior happens. And then uh, the Muni in their traffic calming uh, division then works on it through traffic. And so it's a whole thing, but uh, appreciate that because uh, speeding is definitely an issue throughout the neighborhood. Let's see. And if anyone wants to raise their hand or ask a question, that would be great too. I'm just trying to look for some questions. Nope, okay. There's, it's a whole separate thing. Uh, okay, Kelly has a question about the tunnel under Spinard Road. It's kind of by the McDonald's um, and gets you onto Turnigan Boulevard. Um, but there are, are often people or just things going on down there that you don't wanna necessarily walk through that tunnel and it's the safest way to cross that section of Spinard. And so is that ever an issue that you deal with through APD? Just um, sometimes people are sleeping under the tunnel, there's fires, uh, different things happen down there. I can look and see as far as calls okay. for service and um, some of that, but that's something that we can definitely push out to folks and make sure they're aware that it's a concern and um, at least try and make it out there as much as we can to to talk to folks. And um, it's also something where you can report uh, the, if you go to media.org and report the camp there, that's something that there's also a lot of follow-up on the community action policing team um, where they'll go and work on some of those longer term solutions with folks. Uh, but on a on a the patrol side, we can definitely try and get folks out there on foot and talking. Mm -hmm. A question I have that's kind of more general is I I think a few weeks ago there was a story about how uh, calls to APD have been going down, and that's like people calling in for service. Um, sure. It, does that track with the amount of crime? Like is the amount of crime also going down or is that just phone calls? So unfortunately I don't have all those numbers in front of me. Um, and that's something that uh, may be better directed towards um, folks in, in command. Um, I know as far as the general trends is typically when there's calls for service, um, when they decrease, it would also indicate that um, crime is decreasing as well. Uh, but like I said, I don't have those numbers and I couldn't give you a firm answer on that. Uh, it looks like Amber has a question. Yeah, I'm not sure if this was brought up already, but um, I'm just curious. I know on Nextdoor, a lot of people have been um, mentioning that people are getting into their vehicles again. And that seems like it's kind of on an uptick. And I believe someone stole something out of my vehicle. It was only a jacket. And I'm actually happy that I could like give someone something warm and they didn't take everything out of my vehicle. But I have noticed if we are forgetting to leave our vehicles locked, there is definitely, and I'm not sure if, I know we need more patrols during two and three in the morning. So I just wanted to throw that out there and say, thank you so much for your service. We really appreciate you. Absolutely. So as far as the uh, vehicles, um, definitely keeping them locked is going to be um, the number one deterrent. But then as far as uh, vehicle prowlers and things like that, it's always a good idea to call um, because we do, we respond to those as quickly as possible. Um, and we, we do, so as we're driving around um, on, on mid shift specifically is um, folks that are just kind of walking the street, you can tell that they're trying vehicles, they're trying doors on houses and things like that. That's something where we do talk to them um, and uh, pursue that and investigate it and see, see what all occurred. Um, but calling those in, especially if you see them in a car um, see somebody getting into a car or something like that that looks out of place or you see them in someone's backyard or something like that. Uh, placing that call um, to 311 or 911 as appropriate uh, is definitely something that's worth doing because we'll, we'll respond and be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay. I I think there's discussion going on in the chat, um, but any other questions for Officer Mays? 
Bob. Yeah. Hi, this is, there's something that's just happened recently, but it's sort of recurring in that there was, seems to be cars that are dumped by Northwood Park that seem to be obviously stolen because their one was towed there and then all the tires were removed and it was just stuck there. And another one was placed there today that was clearly disabled and just left there. And, and it, it sometimes has taken weeks to get these cars tagged and towed. And here they're sitting basically uh, right in a parking space for a popular park. And so is there any way to get these, these cars kind of tagged and removed a little sooner rather than later? Sure, so the, so the process for um, tagging and removing cars, there's several different uh, ways that it can be handled, but one is the junk or um, abandoned vehicles. Um, and that's something that uh, is a contract with the, that the city has with uh, different tow, tow companies. And so depending on that contract um, and how, you know, whether it's taking up a parking space, whether it's on public property, um, along the street, all of that determines what tag that it gets. And that would dictate the, uh, the time frame for its removal. Um, but that's something that we can go look and make sure that all those cars that are abandoned there are tagged. Um, and then if it's a public safety issue, right, if it's blocking the road, um, if it's parked illegally along the street, that's something that we can also um, deal with in, in a different way, right? We, we can safe keep those cars, we can tow those cars immediately um, and remove them that way. But if it's in a, in a parking spot, um, it would have to be tagged and go through that process. But definitely something that, we, that I can follow up on and go make sure those cars are tagged. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not, I don't think I see other questions for Officer Mays, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I know Cameron, you just added a lot to the chat. Anything you wanna say before we move into our presentation from AMAX? No, just, just just trying to, to respond. It's it's important to me that that all of the questions be, be answered. So, but I would also encourage folks to email me and and I'll do what I can to get back to them as soon as I can. But I really appreciate the the questions. So thanks. Great, thank you. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Joni Wilm. Welcome. Uh, she is a senior planner with AMAPS, the Anchorage Metropolitan Area Transportation Solutions Department, whatever that stands for. Um, but we've invited her, we've mentioned the last few months that the non-motorized plan is out for comment. And that's a new plan for Anchorage that combines uh, the old trail, pedestrian and bicycle plan. And uh, last month we formed a uh, work group to come up with some draft comments for our council to consider, but we wanted to invite Joni to share and give a big broad overview. And then we can um, talk about our draft comments and hopefully adopt those because the comment period is coming right up. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joni and you're welcome to share your screen um, and take it from there. Thanks, Lindsay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Oh, great. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. And um, I, I'm i gonna give a presentation. I've, I've given it, uh, I don't even know how many times in the last few months. So um, I apologize if you've seen it once, twice or maybe five times, but you're just gonna have to suffer through it again. So um, it is, I'm just actually gonna take the open house presentation. If you didn't, weren't able to attend the open house last week, we had a great one, uh, Lindsay attended. And I think we had about 16 or so folks. Um, so it's just a broad brush overview of the plan. Um, and then we can and hopefully spell out our process from here. And I'm gonna try to share my screen, which is always the first step. So um, can everyone see this, this presentation? Yes. Looks good. Okay, great. Okay, now I'm gonna do slideshow here. Okay, so, and then also um, if you want to during this present, and this is a sign in sheet QR code, so um, you don't need to worry about that one, but 
that we, we made a couple surveys for the plan. So um, during the presentation, we had two of them. So if you want, they're just short little five question surveys. If you want to just um, scan that code with your phone and do them as I'm presenting, that's great. They're up on our website also. So you can go there as well if you want to do them. We'd love to have your feedback. And um, anyways, appreciate all the feedback we can get. Just real quick, uh, the comment period has been 60 days. It will be 60 days on March 5th. March 5th is Friday. That is the last day that the plan is open for comment, for public comment. In this, in this um, opportunity, there will be some opportunities coming up, which we'll talk about later. So just so you know that, we have also had an extensive um, review period so far, internal agency review. We collected over 400 comments from our internal agency folks. Um, so the plan's been through a lot of review uh, so far. We are continuing to take comments. We've had a lot, lot of comments from the public so far. So again, welcome and um, excited to get your feedback. So um, this was just our agenda, but I'm Joni, that's me on the left, uh, doing a Clouton LA last summer with my dog, Sophie. And um, it's the one photo I had my bike helmet on. So. I thought that was fitting, but um, anyways, this was just our agenda for last week's open house. This is my email at the bottom. You can feel free to contact me there, just joni.wilm at anchorjk.gov or also through the AMATS info website, which I can put in the chat box. Um, oh, just sorry, real quick. I'm the project man manager for this plan. I'm also the senior transportation planner with AMATS and also worked on the Spinard quarter plan. So you guys might recognize me from that as well. This was our first survey, just a very um, broad overview. When did you hear about the plan survey? So if you, if you wanna take that, feel free. I'm gonna skip on to that next slide. And I know it's annoying to take a survey when someone's talking, but <clears throat> I, I'm going to keep going because I don't have time to wait. So um, anyways, so here's a presentation on a non-motorized plan. That, that was our cover there on the left. Um, our, just an overview of our team. We had our lead consultant, Alta Planning and Design. They're from uh, their national uh, non-motorized planning um, team. They are recognized for their expertise in pedestrian and bicycle design and planning. We also had local engineering consultants, r &M, and we had local public involvement folks from Huddle with Holly Spoth Torres and her team over there. Um, the general contents of the plan, it's made up of seven chapters, which I'm just gonna briefly touch on today, but um, basically the introduction to the plan followed by existing conditions which was basically our analysis or the team's analysis of what was happening now, um, including all kinds of data that was incorporated into the planning document. Um, then public involvement chapter talks about our public involvement process. It was over three and a half years of involvement with folks. Uh, we also have uh, chapter four, which is the network development chapter. It basically takes all the info that we got in the first three chapters and uses that information to make recommendations on a future network for non-motorized facilities. And then chapter five takes the info in chapter four, which is our recommendations, and then prioritizes it in high, medium, or low um, prioritizations. So we can figure out what to start on first. And then finally, our, our implementation chapter is next, which has some really cool components that I'll talk about. And then finally, our design guide, we wanted to take advantage of our consultants expertise since they're design national and international design experts. Um, so we have an entire chapter devoted to design guidance. And then our appendices has all of our um, meeting notes and attendee lists and everything in there. So it's quite long. That starts on 183. I think the plan is uh, 300 and something pages. So the appendix is quite big. So just to start out, um, our non-motorized facilities for this plan are made up of three primary networks. Uh, there's pedestrian network, the bicycle network, and the shared use path network. For the purposes of this plan, and we've gotten a lot of questions so far from folks about trails, um, we did intend to do a robust trails update in this planning effort, but we quickly realized um, when we started that we weren't gonna have enough resources and our 
GIS data for the municipal data database needed to be updated. And so we just weren't, we weren't gonna have the resources do a huge trails update as well. So this plan focuses on these three networks. There are major ped and bike and shared use pathway networks. Um, and so we will be following this planning effort up in a year or two with a comprehensive trails update. So just saying that up front. Um, this is the AMATS planning area. You can see on the left-hand map there, um, the facilities that we recommended for this planning area include sidewalks, enhanced shared roadways, which I'll show you. There's two types, uh, separated bikeways, also two types, um, shared use pathways and side paths, equestrian trails, and supplemental bicycle facilities. And when we started out with our public involvement workshops and focus groups, and stakeholder groups um, and advisory groups were all um, were all put to the task of developing this vision statement, which I'll just read out for the committee here. Um, Anchorage is a world-class northern city that has an integrated network of routes accessible for people of all ages and all abilities to walk, roll, or glide safely on shared use pathways and streets. And this vision statement um, comes in tandem with seven goals, which I'll also read out. So goal one for the overall plan is to increase the use of the non-motorized network. Goal two is to promote and improve health and quality of life. Goal three is improve safety and security. Goal four, optimize maintenance for all seasons. Goal five, connect communities through all modes to all destinations. Goal six, measure non-motorized use and assets. And then goal seven, build community through education and outreach. So that's, again, broad overview, chapter one. Chapter two gets into the work that we did to figure out what was happening on Anchorage in AMATS, the AMATS um, area already. So started out with a pretty robust plan review of existing documents. We also did a peer city review. Um, and I think I'm kind of short on time today, so I'm not gonna totally go into the depth of this peer city review, but basically we looked at five other winter cities to try and glean what they were doing that we could do better that would improve our mode share. The cities we looked at included um, Madison, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Calgary, Alberta, and Montreal, and Quebec. And these were some uh, takeaways from that peer city review. And again, I'm not gonna read through these, but um, they're listed out in the chapter two. We also did a um, analysis of existing facilities. So here's the bike existing bike network map and you can see the existing facilities of bike boulevards, bike lanes, paved shoulder bikeways and um, shared use pathways. We also looked at vision zero, which was the most current um, crash data that we could get our hands on at the time. So from the vision zero plan, I think was adopted in 2018. Uh, we also did a level of tra traffic stress analysis, look at this level of stress to a non-motorized user on all the different roadways in Anchorage. And this analysis takes into account four factors. Um, those factors are the posted speed limit, the street width, are there bike lanes? And then if there are, what are the characters, characteristics of those bike lanes? And then takes all those four factors together and comes up with the level of stress analysis one to four. Um, four being the highest, one being the lowest. So you can see some of our high, higher stress roadways here in the red um, and lower stress roadways there in the blue. Uh, we also, also did a demand analysis to look at where folks live, work, play, shop, access transit and go to school. We also did health and equity uh, analysis. So here are the health indicators we looked at. And then the equity indicators we looked at um, include the items listed on the left. This is also a map showing the, the concentrations of where those, those indicators are the highest. So this is a really important map for us um, as planners because we can see where our most vulnerable populations are and where they really need our facilities. Um, just to note too, the, equity, the indicators for the health uh, which you can see here, also had a very similar um, display when mapped out. So we didn't create two maps, but you can think of this map as an indicator of both health and equity to see where our most vulnerable populations are in Anchorage. 
chapter three is about public involvement. So we just detail all the activities we did, the workshop, presentations, mobile meetings, stakeholder interviews, field data collection, walk audits, an online community survey. And then we also had an app that folks could log on to with their phone and um, submit comments from the trail. Um, in addition to that, we had two advisory committees, a citizen advisory group and an agency advisory group. We also had mobile meetings um, with several uh, nonprofits here in Anchorage and um, now, oh, sorry, nonprofits and other groups. I shouldn't just limit it to nonprofits, but um, some key takeaways from those mobile meetings here, um, which I won't read through. Uh, we also had a winter maintenance forum. This was actually at the end of our, no, this was actually at the beginning of our public outreach efforts. So this was a, a good exercise. We did it in September of 2017. We are planning on following up this planning effort with another winter maintenance forum at the tail end to help us since it's, it's such a big issue here. Um, and uh, that gets us into chapter four which is the network development. So like I said before, what we did here is take all of the info in chapters one, two, and three and use that to make recommendations um, for a future network. So here is the proposed bicycle network that you can see in the, um, the map that shows uh, enhanced shared roadway recommendations in purple, separated bikeway recommendations in orange and shared use pathway recommendations in green. Um, like I said, I was going to before go into these types just a little bit. The enhanced shared roadway, there's two types. There's yield roadways on the left and there's bike boulevards that you can see on the right. Um, so those are the two types of enhanced shared roadways. Separated bikeway also has two types. On the left are the buffered bicycle lanes, which there we have one now in Mountain View that I've biked, which is I've really enjoyed biking on that. I felt very comfortable. Um, then we also have protect, protected bicycle lanes. We don't really have these yet in Anchorage, but you can protect the bicycle lane either by, in this photo, it demonstrates raising a raised curb. So the bicyclist is actually raised up from the road level on a raised curb, or you can have a bike lane with um, physical barriers such as delineators or planters, um, something like that. And then finally, the shared use pathways. Those are two types. So we have an amazing, amazing shared use pathway network here in Anchorage, we're so lucky. But the shared use pathways um, are typically your Tony Knowles Coastal Trail, your Chester Creek Trail, um, Camel Creek Trail. They're beautiful, they're off street, they're dedicated for two-way travel and they accommodate just about every user. And then the side path is similar to that, which you can see on the right, but um, the difference being the side path is directly located next to a roadway. So it's adjacent to a parallel to an existing roadway. And then for the pedestrian network, um, we came up with a um, recommendation for corridors to focus on, primary and secondary corridors. And the reason that we did not recommend individual projects is because we already have a pedestrian plan that has over 300 projects uh, recommended in it. Uh, only a handful of those have been implemented in the last, um, since that plan was <clears throat> adopted, largely in part because they're so dang expensive to, um, to fund. And then um, secondly, we, we, have a lot, we have a lot of updating to with our municipal uh, GIS data before we can do a more robust um, accounting of all of our sidewalks. So we really need to get that in place first. But in this plan, we, we recommend corridors, primary and secondary, and we also include all the projects from the previous plan. So those are all included. <clears throat> Excuse me, chapter five gets into prioritization. So now we've made recommendations and now we need to prioritize them in high, medium or low. So, um, and Lindsay, feel free to let me know if I'm running short on time or whatever, but try to zip through the rest of these. Um, so for prioritization, <clears throat> we had six criteria that were used. I've tried to lay them out here graphically so that you can see how they were weighted. Connectivity was the highest weighted. Health and equity, gap closure and safety were all weighted about the same. And then public support, which is 
did this project receive support in this planning effort? And then previous support, did the project receive support in a previous planning effort? So that those were the criteria we used. And I don't think I'm gonna go through this table um, because of time, but um, basically each of those criteria are listed in this prioritization criteria matrix. So for each project that we recommended, it went through this table, um, looking at each different criteria, connectivity, health and equity. These are just three of the ones listed here. But basically it went through this entire process of looking at the, um, looking at the criteria, what the description of the criteria meant, where that criteria was pulled from. So was the project close or close to a demand, high demand area? And then what distance, how far away from that high demand area was it? A quarter mile, half mile, or not close? And that um, determined the score for that particular facility. So with score of high, medium, or low, high was five, medium three, and low one. Um, so anyways, I know this part is complicated. It's more data heavy and I can answer questions on that later, but for now, you get sort of the gist of how we did that. Um, and then we did the same process for the, for the uh, pedestrian network. So now we have the corridors that were identified, but we have them um, listed in high, medium, and low priority. Oh, sorry. No, this is, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the bike network. These are the facilities you just saw uh, that we had recommended and hand shared roadway and all that stuff, but now they're prioritized. So this is the bike network map. This is the pedestrian network map, high, medium, low corridors. Sorry about that. And then chapter six, implementation. Um, this was a super important chapter. We really wanted to empower the public and people that are not transportation professionals to be able to figure out what's involved when you recommend a certain type of project. Um, so what we did was we picked six different project types. So we have a intersection, a trail crossing, a complete streets renovation, a bike boulevard, sidewalk infill, and a multi-use pathway. And for each of these project examples, we had our local engineers um, provide a project description and locator map, challenges, conceptual design, and costs for construction and maintenance, some funding options, and a potential timeline. So here's an example from chapter six. Um, this is the intersection project. It's 10th Avenue in Cordova. So you can see the, um, the nice graphics that were uh, created, project challenges, maintenance estimates. You can also see the um, cost estimates for construction. So they include everything from engineering, construction, utility relocation, right-of-way acquisition, and contingency, and then some potential funding options and an implementation timeline, a rough implementation timeline. So this is for each of those six different types of projects. I really hope that's gonna help us as a community figure out, um, help figure out what we wanna recommend for funding in the future. Um, Hey, Joni, we're coming yes. up on time. Can you just wrap it up in just like another yes. minute? Yes, OK. So we also have a couple more things, implementation chapter, which I won't talk about. This is important, the matrix. Um, and then chapter seven, again, as I mentioned, just a big design chapter and has all kinds of design recommendations in it. And then there's the QR code for survey number two, if you want to get that real quick. And then just real quick, this is our next steps. So um, we, after March 5th, we're gonna log all of the comments um, and respond to them. And then April, we hope to go forward to our technical advisory committee. May, we're hoping to get to the assembly. Um, and then June, we're hoping to get to the policy committee for review and approval. That's a tentative timeline, but those are all, I just wanna show these because they're all potential um, opportunities for you to comment again if you miss the March deadline. So um, that's it. That's all I had. Great. Thank you, Joni. I know that was a lot of information and there was just like an ongoing conversation in the chat. So I'm trying to okay. 
trying to distill if there are any questions to share. And there was a discussion just about um, some of the bridges along Fish Creek Trail, which we actually may be having um, some folks with Parks and Rec join us pretty soon because they're talking. We're talking about um, a connection from Uri Park onto the Fish Creek Trail, which would require a bridge. Um, but we did have uh, engineers who were putting that project together when they repaved Fish Creek Trail um, present a few times about the different design plans. And the bridges are really big, and it's because of the floodplain. And there's a lot of technical engineering reasons and funding reasons for all that. But a really good question just about you know, the infrastructure that we're putting in place. And I just want to help frame that this document isn't just about bike lanes. It's about making our community safer. And we just, we convened a work group two times this last month to talk about this plan, come up with some draft comments. And the way we framed it was really thinking about what are the places within our community that we want to be able to get to safely? A lot of people walk, they walk their dogs, they walk to schools, kids especially, um, and we don't have sidewalks like other neighborhoods and we, we don't have necessarily a lot of safe uh, ways to go through our community. And in this last month, somebody was just killed at 35th in Minnesota, trying to cross the street there. Uh, a pedestrian was, and, and that happens a lot. So we're thinking about vulnerable users people on foot or on bike who could come up against uh, fast vehicles. And these improvements make our roadway safer for everybody. Better for people driving, better for people walking, um, and for transit users. So it, it really is a big picture approach. And it's a function of the community council to really think about what our neighborhood looks like and how we're connected and why. So I'm gonna put into the chat a link that has, uh, that is linked to our comments. And at the beginning of the meeting, I pointed it out, uh, the draft comments we created as a group. And at the beginning of the meeting, I pointed it out that you could uh, look at those there. And then um, we'll go to a couple questions and then we'll just do a, a, another uh, form for a vote on if we should sign on to it or not. And um, we'll then kind of keep us rolling from there. Um, but while I do that, it looks like we've got a question from Sarah. Uh, thanks. Um, Joni, you talked about the winter maintenance forum. Approximately yeah. when would that be? Um, so we don't have it scheduled yet, but I was thinking, um, I was thinking it would be nice to schedule it, you know, uh, after the snow is gone. So um, maybe June. Probably okay. in the summer, maybe June or July. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And we had a lot of folks who joined in our work group this past month. Sarah was one of them. Um, Bob and Peggy Off and Julie Leonard. Um, do any of you want to share just some feedback about how we put these comments together or any just big picture points you want to point out to the group? Oh, we, Bob, go ahead. I mean, one of the one of the things, uh, and it's sort of discussed a little bit in the in the comments too, is that I mean, this is more than just oh, let's have some nice bike trails and some nice bike bridges. This is about people being able to walk safely to to the grocery store, to their jobs to places they have to go and to get there to get there safely and and if they're not sometimes they get injured and 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 sadly killed and I mean that's that's certainly been my my priority in being involved is is safety and 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 basic basic transportation not everybody has a not everybody has a car but they still need to get to work and they still need to do all the things they need to do. And why shouldn't they be allowed? A, why, why, why shouldn't pedestrians be allowed a safe, safe access to where they need to go? I don't think this is fancy or elitist. I think this is basic. Yeah, absolutely agree. 
Great. So um, if you uh, click on the link to look at the comments, like I said, they're extensive. Um, and we have an advantage. We just went through the whole process to create the Spinard Corridor Plan, which looked at land use and transportation in our community. So we started with a side-by-side -side review of the non-motorized plan, the Spinard Corridor Plan, and talked big picture about what we want to see in the neighborhood. So um, they're pretty involved comments, and I think it gets a, a a really good way to kind of bridge those two documents together. And so I added a form into the chat um, for members to vote on if we should approve um, and sign on and submit these comments on Friday. Um, you can vote if you have a business or a residence within the boundaries of Spinard Road, or excuse me, of Spinard neighborhood. And um, if you've attended a meeting at least once in the last 12 months, but we'll be able to verify all of that in the form um, if, you, if you have questions or aren't quite sure. I'm gonna put it in there again so we can go ahead and, <clears throat> and vote on that. And I'll let folks know, um, you know, once people have time to do it and let me know if you have trouble with it, you know, type it in the chat, I can help you with that. Um, but with that, I think that, um, I think that will keep us rolling. Uh, thank you, Joni. And uh, we're going to stick to the transportation topics and welcome uh, Lakita with Dowell to talk about the Chugach Way Area Transportation Elements Report. Hi, I'm going to share my screen here. Everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Uh, good evening. My name is Laquita Chmielowski, and I am the land use planning manager at Dow and working on the Chugach Way Transportation Elements Project. Um, and I am working with Beat Tobish, who is a senior land use planner at the municipality of Anchorage. And we also have, um, we've teamed with CRW on this project uh, to provide traffic uh, engineering support as well as some planning support. And I know some of you probably heard from Renee last month, who's also with Dell and came to just give you a project introduction. I'm here tonight to give you a little more, a few more details about the project, um, where we're at and what we have planned moving forward. And so with that, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my other screen. Um, so I just wanna share the project vision. So our vision is to identify um, roadway improvements with along Chugach Way that support opportunities for redevelopment with an emphasis on safety, access, and multimodal facilities in the area. And so we created this vision statement so that we could always be looking at this as we move forward with this project. And as you can see on the map here, um, right now our project boundaries are from 36th Avenue down to 40th Avenue in the north-south direction. And then Spinard Road, Minnesota Road, or Minnesota Drive, all the way over to Arctic Boulevard. So that's that's our current boundary. Um, and so most of you know that the municipality has been focused on revitalizing Spinard, and we recognize that Chugach Way um, has upgrades that are needed that are integral to supporting redevelopment in this particular section of Spinard. And so, fitting in with our vision. Uh, for this project, our ultimate goal is to come up with a roadway alternative that would include multimodal facilities that supports the existing and future development in the area. So, you know, we recognize there's a lot going on right now um, here, you know, see has got some development happening. There's some rezoning happening in this area. So we want to make sure that that we come up with a good roadway alternative and that roadway alternative would ultimately be the basis of a project that moves forward to design and construction. Um, so that's, that's the goal of this project. And right now we're working on the existing condition summary. And just like the name says, we're, we're organizing and gathering all the existing information that we have. So everything from technical information as far as utilities, land uses, um, traffic patterns, and then also looking at um, all the reports and comprehensive plans and land use plans that have been done over the years and summarizing all of that in, the, in one document. And the reason that's important is because that is kind of the basis for our decisions as we move forward 
as and, and start looking at alternatives. Um, so we're just, like I said, in the midst of, of doing all that work, um, we plan on coming back to you all to give you updates and get input as we go along. We'll probably be back in a couple months as we finish up the existing conditions summary report and then start getting into the weeds on looking at alternatives. And I know you guys are a active group and I really appreciate that and it helps our projects be successful. So I really encourage you to provide us with your input along the way. Um, you know, I can go out and gather all this information that's out there, but it, it's really helpful to have the institutional knowledge that all of you have from living and working in this area to make sure we have the best alternative at the end of this project. And right now it looks like that our project will be hopefully wrapped up by the um, by this fall. And so with that, I, I would encourage you to um, provide us with your, with your input. And one of the ways that you can do that is to go to our project webpage, which is chugatchway.com and I'll put that in the chat. Um, and when you go there at the top of the screen is a we want to hear from you button. And when you click on that, it'll take you to the project team page. And right at the top is a link to our email, which is transportation elements at chugatchway.com. So that's the easiest way to get information or input to us. Um, you can also do that through your community council or when we're here in person. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Arena while we do that to, to check the form again for business sign up. We don't have it linked to the right spot for them to vote. Um, so she's she's working on that. Um, you think I there, fixed it? Um, so if it, it, it's still, tried to, it's still it, not working? Yeah, okay. and it needs a, you need to add a section for the okay. vote. So she's working on it, it's happening. Don't worry, <laughs> we'll get it. Um, do we have any questions for Lakita about the uh, Chugach Bay area project? There is one question, is, that, is this why some houses along 36th Avenue were removed? Yeah, I, th this project's unrelated to the housing, any houses being removed. No, I didn't know about that. No. Okay, any other? Julie, I know you live up to Gatch Way and you care about this. <laughs> You're muted though. I do, and I did read through that. I haven't looked at it recently, but um, I will go through it again and submit some concerns. I know one big concern of mine, well, a couple of them, is the fact that there's no sidewalks so it's really a dangerous place to walk in the summer and even more so in the winter because no one adheres to the 25 mile an hour speed zone. It's 40, 50 miles an hour cruising that road. So I'm really interested to see some safety measures on that street. Yeah, and that's definitely something that we're taking into consideration as we get a little further along. Great, thank you. I know that it'll this will be a big project and I know that we'll have your team back um, on this. Uh, and we do have a question from Karen Button. Um, what is the actual process and timeline? Sure, so um, as I mentioned right now, we're gathering all that existing information to summarize it in a report. And then we will start looking at um, roadway pedestrian facility alternatives. Um, and we'll be coming back uh, Probably the next time you see us, we, we may be at a point where we have some alternatives to share and get your feedback to help us um, make sure we come up with the best alternative at the end. So this is kind of an iterative process once we start looking at alternatives. Uh, and then all of that will get summarized in a report um, at the very end of the project. And then that's where our work stops and that whatever ends up being the preferred alternative is what the municipality would then go seek funding for to turn it into an actual 
design and construction projects. Lindsay, can I just say something real quick? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm barging in. Um, I just wanted to say also the Spinard Corridor Plan um, has listing of local street designs in it, and I can send the link with a page number um, to you. But um, we had our uh, we had our consultants, um, which is also out in planning and design for the Spinard Corridor Plan, draw up several examples of what a street like Chugach Way could look like with that limited right of way because it's only thirty feet, and so. Um, uh, there are several examples of what could be done to that street that you might want to just take a peek at. It's already in the adopted plan, and this is to the folks at this meeting here, and I'm sure that, um, you know, the consultants have already taken a look, but if you want to just look at the plan, it's got some examples to give you an idea of what it could look like um, redesigned to be more bike and pred friendly. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that tip. Um, and, and another part of Karen's question is just, are alternatives being developed out of the feedback that you're receiving right now? Yeah, we're not quite to the, to the point where we're developing alternatives, but we, we're getting there soon. And then of course we will take everyone's feedback. And, and like I said, it's an, inter, an iterative process as you develop the alternatives and kind of get them to a preferred. Great. Okay, I don't think I'm seeing any more Chugachway questions. Thank you for being here and um, chugachway.com. So it's really simple and easy, but um, we'll have you all back. Thank you. As well. ah, thank you. All right, we're still doing the voting because I messed up the form. Um, and so we'll go ahead into the neighborhood and community announcements, the best time of the meeting where we, um, ask anyone uh, in Spinard who wants to introduce themselves, especially if it's your first time visiting, we welcome you to the meeting. And so you're welcome to introduce yourself, let us know which little part of the neighborhood you're in. If you have uh, any community events, announcements, that kind of stuff, you can also share that with the group. Uh, we also have a lot of folks who are running for office, and this is also the time to just give a brief introduction of who you are. Um, we say like one to two minutes for everybody in all of these announcements, and I will take the liberty of the first announcement, which is that the Spinard Community Council is working on a candidate forum, two forums for school board and for uh, the mayoral candidates. So I'll put the information into the chat, but Part of the reason we, we have all of the candidates just do really quick announcements is because there are many, uh, but also because we work on putting together a candidate forum with Turnigan, North Star, Sand Lake Community Councils every year. So we are going forward with that. It will be on Zoom and we're gonna figure out the technology and it's gonna be great, um, but I'll put the information into the chat and we have links on our website. If you just go to our main page, um, but you can also just click onto the Facebook if you do the Facebook thing. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And we have a lot of people again, who are part of that planning team. So if anyone else wants to share more, please do. Um, but with that, I'm gonna try to look at who's raising their hands, um, who's waving at me, that kind of stuff. And what I see first is we'll go to Paul and then Forrest sent me a message. So we'll go Paul, Forrest, and then folks, uh, Cheryl. Uh, two things. Uh, first, thanks for the support at the carousel. Although we did get served during this meeting for non-compliance with the EO for having over-occupancy on a Sunday night, which is very unusual, but I will address that tomorrow and probably end up paying the fine for Spinard. Number two, uh, our symbol is the uh, palm tree. Is there anything new going on with that? I'd love to see it get up somewhere. Right now it's sitting languishing on the corner of 36 and Spinard Road, and that's not the place for our symbol to be. So um, anything going on with that? That's my question. Yes, um, and you might have missed our uh, last meeting. We shared about the palm tree, um, that there will be a future home for it yes. back, back on its, um, its corner at 30th and Spinard. Uh, Cindy Berger worked on uh, getting the palm tree and she's going to work on the lighting and installing it while they're breaking ground on the 30th avenue project the road sidewalk project so can you send me her contact just so i can help her out with that 
Yes, yeah. So we're 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 gonna hopefully have a palm tree raising party later this year. That's awesome. And uh, just want to thank Bernadette Wilson for saving it. Oh yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Now we'll go to Forrest, Cheryl, and then Carl, and then Amber. Well, thank you, Lindsay, and thank you to the Spinard Community Council for letting me introduce myself tonight. Uh, my name is Forrest Dunbar, and I'm running for mayor to get us past this public health crisis and get our economy back on track. A little about me, I'm a lifelong Alaskan, originally from Eagle on the Yukon River in Cordova on Prince William Sound. My parents are Miriam, a former special education aide and librarian, and Roger, who worked for 30 years for Fish and Game. Growing up, I worked as a wildland firefighter, commercial fishermen, and stock shelves at Fred Meyer. I know what it's like to put in a hard day's work, and I know how tough things have been in our city. As some of you may know me from my work representing East Anchorage on the Assembly. Since I was first elected in April of 2016, I focused my efforts on jobs, quality of life, public safety, and homelessness. Before the Assembly, I worked in the community as the Vice President of the Scenic Foothills Community Council and helped found the Muldoon Farmers Market. I'm a captain in the Alaska Army National Guard and serve on the board of the Anchorage Parks Foundation. Since I started running in October of 2019, our campaign has been endorsed by the Anchorage Education Association, the AFL-CIO, the Alaska Center, the International Association of Firefighters, Local 1264, and dozens of community leaders like Senator L.B. Gray Jackson and your own Representative Harriet Drummond. My team, my supporters, and I know we've developed the strongest plan to reinvigorate Anchorage's economy and the broadest coalition to make that plan a reality. I'm running for mayor because I want to make Anchorage an even better place to live. Anchorage should be an exciting city. We have advantages few other cities can claim, including a world-class parks and trail system, a deep indigenous history, and a diverse rising generation of Alaskans ready to contribute. I believe in this city and what we can accomplish together. We get our economy back on track, our kids back in school, and Anchorage back to work by coming together and beating COVID, not ignoring it. We can reclaim our future together if we hold on to the idea that Anchorage's best days are still ahead of us. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Forrest. Um, and he will be at our forum. Lots of these folks who will share yeah. will be at a forum. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, so we'll go to Cheryl, Carl, Amber, and then Pat. Cheryl, welcome. I'll Hi, good evening. President. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Cheryl Antonucci, and I'm very happy to be a Spinard resident. And I'm also a nutrition educator with the Anchorage Health Department, uh, working with the SNAP Ed program. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about SNAP-Ed and some of the work that we're doing and hopefully we'll be doing this summer. Um, so we understand that many people face challenges making informed, healthy nutrition um, decisions, and it's really difficult on a limited budget. Uh, we work with local um, organizations to reach SNAP-Ed community members. And we also realize that positive nutrition messages benefit uh, the community as a whole. Uh, so our SNAP-Ed program is mainly um, focused on increasing the likelihood that SNAP eligible community members will have access to healthy foods. So we're working on nutrition education in community settings, such as grocery stores and farmers markets, um, places where our community members shop and play. Uh, we're also um, focusing on a healthy retail recognition program to make uh, food choices more accessible to SNAP eligible community members in grocery stores and to provide nutrition education in grocery stores. Um, we're also actively involved with the, um, with the Alaska Food Coalition to educate community leaders about how nutrition education can address food security in Alaska. And I just wanted to take a moment tonight to introduce our SNAP-Ed program and to invite you to contact me if you're interested in health promotion, nutrition education, um, food security. I will leave my information in the chat. And thank you very much. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. All right, so next we've got Carl, Amber, Pat, Sarah, Bill Falsey. It's gonna work. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Carl Jacobs. I am a candidate for CG on the board. I know there are uh, between 10 and 15 school board candidates. To make it easier for you, I'm one of the only two candidates running for CG, the last on the ballot would encourage everyone to please fill out your ballots all the way down and, and make sure that you vote on the uh, school board races. There are four, so a full majority of the board will be elected this April. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I have served as a, a public servant and someone who has served and protected our vulnerable seniors and children as an investigator and regulatory enforcement specialist. In addition, my wife Alicia and I have served as licensed therapeutic foster parents to dozens of youth over the last decade. 
We specialize in teenagers who have diagnosed mental health and behavioral health challenges. And it has provided us a perspective to identify things that our district does well, in addition to things that it needs to improve on. We'll be celebrating our 11th high school graduate with this upcoming May, and we're super excited to continue helping the youth of Anchorage uh, in my role as a school board member. My priorities include focusing on career and technical education and helping our youth successfully transition into an adulthood, addressing the budget challenges that our district has in front of us, and finally addressing the uh, outcome uh, gaps in our district that continually plague us year after year and making sure that our standardized testing scores uh, go up and holding the district administration accountable for its successes as well as areas of improvement. So please do uh, consider uh, attending the uh, West uh, Side Forum. I will be there as well. Uh, my candidate website is carl, the number four, anchorage.com. Would be glad to take any calls or emails from you. My info is uh, on my website, so thank you. Great, thank you. All right, we'll go to <clears throat> Amber, Pat, Sarah Bertner, Bill Falsey, Sarah Prescott. Amber, take it away. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I just, you know, really want to address everyone and let you know how much I um, appreciate everyone showing up. And um, I, my big concerns right now are, are ending all restrictions, all mandates. Um, my kids are barely getting through school. They're wearing their face covering. My daughter has very sensitive skin. She's breaking out. Um, I have PTSD. I have periodontal disease. I have been forced on furlough indefinitely in my workplace because I cannot wear a shield or a face covering and, and I, I can't um, stress to you how many more people there are in this community that um, are in the same exact shoes as I am. I'm a hospitality restaurant worker and we are getting pushed to the very bottom of the barrel and it's upsetting. I, I'm, I've been a Spinard resident since the 90s. Um, I understand the crime here. I understand the drug addiction. I understand the alcoholism. Um, one of my best friend's moms was murdered and raped in Spinard and I've suffered experiences similar to that. And I don't think people understand how serious it is for us to get back to um, ending mandates, letting people who want to wear masks wear masks. Absolutely. I support that. I support vaccines, but I also um, support informed consent. And um, my sister died from an adverse reaction from her vaccine when she was three and, three and a half months old and she passed away. So I, I just want everyone to know that you need to do your research. If vaccines work for you and you don't have any reactions, that's great. But there is a risk. And where there's a risk, there must be choice. And I, I just want to stress that. And I just appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Amber. Um, we're going to go to Pat and Sarah Bertner, Bill Falsey, Sarah Prescott. Pat, take it away. You're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Pat Higgins. Uh, as many of you may know, I was on the school board from 2008 until 2017. We got a lot of things done. We started off with the graduation rates in the low 60%. Uh, dropout rate was 6.5%. We had just adopted everyday math, which proved to be very unpopular with teachers, with students, and parents. And it was, uh, from an academic standpoint, uh, a failure. We had a lot of other challenges on there. During those nine years, we've increased graduation rates above 80%. Dropout rate was in half, with half of those children coming back uh, the next year. So it was a big improvement. Um, we academically uh, grew, but it was slow. Uh, but we had a lot of other accomplishments. We, uh, the board was very active in the board in the uh, administration and the budget. We cut administration costs nine years in a row. Um, I was head of audit. We took on purchasing. That still saves up to half a million dollars a year with revisions that we did. Um, we really got focused on listening to the parents and the, and the staff when they wanted to make eliminate middle schools, the administration, the board listened to the public, listened to principals and teachers and stopped it. And the same thing happened with uh, revisions to high school classes. So the board was active and a, was a loud voice there for the, for the parents and the public and, and the students and the staff. 
Right now, the board is not doing that. Academic scores came down significantly in 2019. There were some serious ethical issues going on, the activities. Uh, and this is the drop in academic scores was prior to uh, the pandemic. It was 2019. And we had other issues as well. They've got a reading program that is being heard from, from teachers and from students alike. It's not differentiated the way we changed it so that all children are getting appropriate education is geared only at grade level. And so there's a lot of concerns about how that's contributing. I'm running again for the board because I know what the board can do. There isn't anyone in there with the historical experience to know that an audit committee is needed in the school, that our voice needs to be in accordance with the National School Board Association and not listen to uh, and say that whatever the superintendent wants, that's our only job is to approve it. So I'm running for seat E as Pat Higgins, Pat Higgins for school board. Um, I stand by the best predictor of future performance is past performance and I'm very proud of that and uh, would appreciate your support. It's uh, pathigginsforschoolboard.com. And this four is actually spelled correctly, F-O-R. So uh, thank you for having this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll go to Sarah Bertner, Bill Falsey, Sarah Prescott, and then we'll go back to Cameron. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Bertner. I am a Spenard resident. I'm near, um, Spinard in Minnesota, um, homeowner for 15 years. I totally love Spinard. Um, I am here tonight representing um, a local nonprofit business. I am the community engagement coordinator for Habitat for Humanity Anchorage. And um, so we're a local affiliate of an international nonprofit. Um, you're probably familiar with our work, but we build affordable homes, partnering with the community, individuals, businesses, other organizations, and the home buyers to make home ownership possible for families who otherwise wouldn't qualify. Um, one of our primary sources of revenue is the Restore. Um, you've probably seen it. It's located in part of the old REI space. We accept donations of new and gently used furniture, appliances, building materials, hardware, and housewares, and we sell them at a discount to the public. Um, and all the proceeds help fund our affordable home ownership program. Uh, this operation has a big impact on our community. It helps re reduce landfill waste um, and makes home improvement more affordable for members of our community. But the main goal, our main goal, is to fund our home builds. Um, at this time of the year, donations tend to slow, and that's definitely been the case this year. Um, and we want to continue offering all of our services to Anchorage. So um, I'm here to ask for item donations. If you have some items sitting around waiting until spring cleaning, I encourage you to get a jump start and bring them on by. Um, on a larger scale, we would love to have support with donation drives. Um, this could be as simple as just sharing with your friends and um, associates that we are there, we'll take donations, um, and word of mouth is great. Um, but it could be more organized where you collaborate with members of your church or organization or service club um, to um, maybe collect and deliver items all at once. Or we can even park our truck in a spot that's more convenient for folks to drop their items off. Um, and we also accept donations from businesses, um, surplus items, remnants, interior items from remodels and redecorating. Um, so we'd love to develop, to develop more of these contacts. Um, and my one more thing, we would like to reach out to landlords to pass on information about our services to uh, their tenants because I know we all see when people move and they dump their things by the dumpster. Um, we offer free pickup and right now things are pretty slow so we can come within a day or two most likely to come pick up items. Um, and then we're reducing people's uh, dump fees as well. Um, so I'm gonna paste my, uh, I was gonna share a slide, but I think I'll save everybody's time. I'm just gonna paste my, uh, my contact information and restore information in the chat for you guys. Um, thank you very much. And I hope to hear from you soon. Great, thanks, Sarah. All right, we'll go to Bill Falsey and then Sarah Prescott and then Cameron. Welcome, well, thank Bill. You. I really appreciate you letting me catch the end of your meeting. I was at the downtown community council and then kid bedtime ran a little bit long, but I'm making the rounds to say I'm Bill Falsey, 
I'm a candidate for mayor. I am running because I really do think our best days are still ahead of us. And I am invested in that future because this is my hometown. I went to Central and to Diamond. My father brought us here when he was stationed at Elmendorf. My mother was a special ed teacher at Rabbit Creek for elementary, elementary school for a number of years. It's where my wife, Jeanette, and I are raising our two kids. I'm the only candidate in the race with significant executive management and local government experience. Folks have seen me at work in the November 2018 earthquake, the 2019 wildfire season, and in 2020 overseeing our on the ground response to the COVID pandemic. I think we have better days ahead, but we do have our work cut out ahead of us. And I have uh, got us through some challenges in the past while delivering on some complex projects. Folks talked about selling MLMP to Tugach for a number of years. I led the team that got it done and bills are really lower. Uh, we talked about getting the port off of High Center. I led the team that got that project moving, the petroleum cement terminal fully funded on time and on budget. I'd like to take that same energy and really deliver some additional solutions as we're getting through the COVID pandemic, through to the recovery and getting to those better days ahead. I'm also gonna be participating in the West Side Forum, so I won't take too much of your time. I just wanted to uh, point you in my direction and let you know how to find me. So I'll put my website and email in the chat and appreciate you letting me catch in. And thanks to Sarah for uh, letting me jump ahead, although I feel guilty about that. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Prescott, hello. Thanks. Um, I will also be super quick. Uh, my name is Sarah Prescott. I am a Spinard resident and I'm also a librarian at Anchorage Public Library. And I just wanna let folks know that the library um, has a project on the bond, it's Proposition 2. And we're also there with uh, the senior centers to, for them to get some upgrades. I will drop a link in the chat if anybody has any questions, but I will send it over to Cameron. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, Cameron. Yeah, I just wanted to, to share this is something, you know, I, I as much as I've I've actually had conversations with a number of the folks on on the on this um, Zoom tonight who have expressed concerns about how the city has handled the the COVID-19. Um, and I've listened to them and I'm continuing to listen to everyone who has their own thoughts about this. But I wanted to, to say that, you know, it's important that you hear from me that vaccines work, masks work, distancing works, hand washing works, um, and the, the decisions that have been made by the city, you know, have led to the low cases that we have. And the problem we collectively have isn't mandates. The problem we collectively have is COVID-19. And, and you may not agree in terms of how we responded or are responding to do that, but that's the collective problem that we have. And so as much as we all have different ideas about how we should uh, handle it, how we did and how we should in, in, in the future, the reality is, is that um, cases are drop, drop, dropping, schools are opening, um, mandates are reducing and that we're moving to a good place in terms of coming back to what we think of as normal. Um, but we have to do it in a really thoughtful and data informed way. And so I just wanted to share that. And I know that many of you on the call don't agree with that, but, um, but, I, but I really think it's important that that narrative comes out as well because it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's very important that uh, that many folks who agree with that that narrative want to hear that as well. So thanks very much. Great, thank you. And this has been a topic, of course, because of the pandemic. And um, Department of Health and Social Services uh, has reached out, so we potentially will have somebody with the state um, at our next meeting to share out more information about vaccines. And that's partly why I have to keep us moving and we, we can't get bogged down on this topic every time um, because I know that some folks are here specifically <laughs> with specific purposes and we have to respect everybody's time and do the business of our community council. So I appreciate everybody being here, but I'm sorry when I like keep rushing and, and try to move through, so I appreciate that. Um, I, before we... Before we go to the giveaway, I'm gonna go back to our non-motorized plan comments and um, we will submit these. I think it was uh, uh, a small vote, 10, four, 10 to approve, uh, three uh, to not. Um, and I would encourage everybody who, who listened in to submit comments by Friday of, of what you think um, they should be changing or improving within that non-motorized plan itself. And uh, with that, we are gonna go to the door prize and we do have a, a request for the council. Um, we 
had been doing these in person. We had gift cards from a past event and we were giving, or excuse me, gas cards away. And we want to support local Spinard businesses and are wanting to request an arena. Do you have the number in front of you, treasurer? Because I believe uh, we would like to request uh, $500 so that we can get gift cards for each month, mail them out if we need to, or some of them are digital. And we always share that in our audits as we go, but we wanna make sure. Ooh, I like the free Harley giveaway, hey. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we just want to have some flexibility. We'll have our executive board figure out and reach out to local businesses. Um, and we put out a request on our Facebook page to just get feedback and input. And we just have this first month because we're kind of doing a ask for forgiveness. We spent this money and we want to make sure that we can continue it going. So that's our request. <laughs> Dia is in. Okay, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rena to do the actual like magic that selects the giveaway based on our attendance form. Hey, sounds good. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, unfortunately, not that many people filled this out. So, um, and I we posted it at like three times. So, if you did not win these gift cards, that's on you. Um, so we have everyone who is a Spinard resident or a business who filled out the form. We have just 13. This week, we're going to be giving away two gift cards. Um, they're for $25 each to Blue Market. Um, we're going to send these electronically. So if you win, if you would mind just putting your email in the chat, um, or I can just try to guess um, up to you. So we'll do it. So everyone's going to sign a number. I'm going to do a random number generator now, and we're going to, we're going to see who wins. Wait, it's thir 13, sorry. The number hey, so is four. What's that? No. Let's see. Oh, oh, who is four? It's Bob. Bob Oth. Oh, really? Bob still on? Hi. Yeah. Bob congrats, still on. Bob. He can claim his. I love, I love Blue Market. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's for the first one. We're going to do it again. Chances are great. The next number is seven. Let's see who that is. Is it me? If it's me, someone else can have it. Looks like we have Erica. We have Erica still on? I don't think so. Erica Chandler? No? Oh, man. <gasps> oh, wait. Snoozy Lou is one more time. Yeah, yeah, they're still here. <laughs> Erica Chenoweth? Oh, Erica well. Chenoweth? Where's she at? Or which one? There's two Ericas. Erica Chenoweth. <laughs> She's here. She's five in the seconds chat. to claim. <laughs> you don't claim. She's in the chat. Do it again. Five, four. Oh, no, she's here. Arena. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Erica, do you want to just um, send an email um, or put your email into the chat? Um, we'll email you the gift card. Sounds good. And I'll email the one to Bob. Yeah, and I see Dia and Paul, and we yeah, we'll follow up. <laughs> Okay, anything else for the good of the group? Okay, our next meeting is April 7th. And um, like I said, we have our candidate forms coming up and I put those in the chat a few times, go to our website or follow us on Facebook. We post a lot there, but we are asking folks to submit questions so that we can ask those for, to the candidates um, since it will all be virtual. And this meeting was a little bit extreme on the chat feature and it's hard for me to run the meeting and pay full attention to that. And uh, a few meetings ago, we had, we had moved away from private chats because those were getting to be um, really distracting, the kind of like sidebar conversations that were happening um, as we went. And so I think that this worked okay, um, but it was, I am gonna have to go back and review this because I think there were a lot of topics being talked about when we weren't talking about those issues. And so you'll just have to bear with us as we try to sift through that, but we're trying to do our best to just keep on track, keep um, to the, the business that we can take action on. Um, so just wanted to, to put that out there. Ooh, someone has a cat. <laughs> Maybe it's Irene. Irene, I'll turn it over to you, Vice President. Thank you. Um, yeah, I felt like reading the chat is kind of um, distracting. And if you think back on when we have um, person in, in person meetings, 
probably no one would speak as much in this tone as they do in the chat because it's easier to write it. But if you sat next to somebody and said this while the meeting was going on, you'd kind of be out of order. And the job of a vice president in this situation or vice chair is parliamentarian. So you follow the structure of Robert's rules of order and you don't distract or interfere or whatever during the meeting. And the chat becomes this very, very personal thing. And comments were made that were questions that couldn't be answered until six more people had chatted. So I felt the whole thing was a little bit disjointed. And Lindsay, of course, you know, I admire your ability to handle this. So just keeping that in mind, as you mentioned, the respect, there are 159,000 differences of opinion, but those aren't what's going to be handled in a meeting like this because someone is loud and strong and they write it in capital letters, et cetera. So I think we need to be careful about this system um, because honestly, in a regular meeting, this could not happen because the meeting would be just so distracted. So Zoom has advantages and pluses, but also this is a, a tough one. So that's mm -hmm. my opinion as someone who's looking at how the, you know, the meeting procedures should be. Continue. Thank you. Thank you. And and the, the comments even now are getting to be a little bit disrespectful. So with that, we're going to, as an exec board, reconvene, figure it out. We want everybody to feel welcome, engaged, and included here. It's hard on Zoom, and so we're going to try to figure it out. But we hope to see you all at the candidate forums. And our next meeting is April 7th. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the meeting. Thanks, Irene. Do we have a second? A second. Who said that? Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay. Good night. Take care. Thank you. Good, Good night, everyone. In April. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.